it's uh, test four next Tuesday, 25 multiple questions, Canvas online. Um, so log in on Tuesday anytime, any from I think midnight to the morning. And it will cover seven, eight, and then nine and 10 together. Okay, the study guide is already available on Canvas. So um, you can use that to help you study for the exam and, tell, and it will tell you what's on the test. And um, so check that out. And then a couple of other final assignments. Quiz four uh, is gonna be due next Tuesday. November 24th. So the way my system works is that the quiz is going to be due on the same day as the exam. So upload that quiz. Okay, if you don't upload it, I'll make that your drop. Um, lab reports. Um, so some people have not turned in their lab reports. So um, you want to start turning in all those lab reports. Once I put zero, especially for those that are watching or listening to my recording, once I put a zero on Canvas, your grade that you see is going to drop. All right, so turn in those lab reports. And um, the last two labs of this course are solubility within a family. And molecular models. So I've been receiving a couple of emails from students saying they were having issues with the software for the molecular models. So you still can be able to do the lab, okay? You still can be able to turn in and at least draw the structures, because uh, that's the point, is to make sure you draw the structures, uh, even with or without the software. Right? So the software just basically helps you get a three-dimensional grasp of how these things look like, you know, in real, quote unquote, real life. So you sh still should be able to do that. And I know most of these softwares are kind of um, difficult. I'm not familiar with this software, but um, my other classes, I teach them another structure software, and that's um, also pretty hard. So learning curve is steep. However, you still should be able to turn in a lab report is what I'm saying. And um, a lot of you in here um, that maybe are listening or not here live, um, you need to turn in lab reports. Okay, maybe only nine or 10 of both my sections have turned in lab reports. So if you have a lab report, turn it in. Okay, all of them. Okay, all of them, not just these two. Right, there's an extra credit uh, Lewis structure assignment. So that's uh, 40 Lewis structures, and I'll give you uh, 25 points towards your homework grade. So it's an honor system. Uh, practice drawing these, okay, so you can get an idea of how these things work or how they are uh, when you construct them. And so 40 Lewis structure problems, that's 25 points. So make sure you do that. I think the due date is on Canvas. I'm not sure what the due date is. I'm thinking it's this Saturday. This Saturday thank you. Okay. So it's going to be due this Saturday. And then the lab notebook for those of you that did the labs. I want to thank you for doing the labs with me. And um, for those of you that did the lab notebook, you can leave it by my office, my uh, door my door mailbox and that's going to be due this Friday. So anytime between now and this Friday, turn that in and I'll put 100 points. Make sure you do it right. If you do it right, I'll give you 100 points. <laughs> if you don't do it right, I'll take off a couple of points here and there. Okay. But it's some points and uh, that should help your grade. All right, if you are remote, these are for the students that are remote and because um, there's students abroad and a student in Texas. Um, you don't have to turn in your lab notebook. I'll put the points in someplace else in your grade. Right. <clears throat> and then finally, um, continue working on these 
clutch prep drills. So it's just another video, okay, another teacher, another tutor, and maybe you get tired of hearing me lecture or watching my videos, you can use them. And uh, just another perspective of learning the material. So make sure you do those. And then I'll, um, you know, there'll be some points or participation points or something if you do those at the end of the term. Okay, I think I'll pause now and ask for any questions. Basically, 10 minutes worth of announcements. All right, questions or comments? All right, so this is where we're at now. So um, for those of you that are here, I also plan to have class Thursday, okay, as a final review. And then Tuesday is the big day when you do your exam and then um, you're done with the course. <coughs> All right, let's go over a couple of more, couple more Lewis structure problems. Uh, I want to go over SO2 with you guys. Right, this is a molecule known as sulfur dioxide. <coughs> All right. So the way you want to construct these Lewis structures, um, you're going to take each atom and find out what they are happy at. Okay, so what is sulfur happy at? Sulfur is below oxygen in the periodic table, so sulfur is happy at 6. Oxygen is happy at 6, uh, but we don't have one oxygen. You see we have two oxygens, so 6 times 2 is going to be 12. Okay, so our goal is to get 18 valence electrons around the SO2 molecule. Okay, 18 valence electrons around this molecule. So I'm going to make my center atom sulfur, okay, because, you know, oxygen, I don't know if oxygen 1 or oxygen 2 will be the center atom, so let's just make it um, sulfur. So I'm going to put a sulfur here, and um, we'll bind our two oxygens, okay. And uh, so there's no charge here, zero charge. Okay, so somehow we got to get zero formal charge here as well. So let me uh, take you away from this. Let me just give you something, uh, a little bit of a toolkit here. So we'll step away from this problem. So here's a tool that um, I like to tell students that I tutor, uh, particularly with regards to oxygen. So um, don't worry about the R here, okay? Uh, worry about the oxygen. So I'm going to have this R, which don't worry about. I'm going to have it with a single bond to oxygen, okay, R with a single bond to oxygen. And um, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? So, um, this has an octet around the oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the octet is fine. Okay, focusing on the oxygen. Okay, uh, what about the formal charge here? Okay, so let's do the formal charge. I'm going to count with me. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, what is oxygen happy at? Oxygen is happy at 6. Okay, what is 6 minus 7? Negative 1. So a single bond to an oxygen, forgetting about this R, will have a negative formal charge. Okay, so that's one thing I want you to keep in the back of your head. All right, um, let me do something where we have a double bond, okay, a double bond to the oxygen. Okay. So tool 1, here's tool number 2. Okay, again, forget about the R, okay? It's just um, an R group or whatever. Okay, focus our attention on the oxygen. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I got my octet satisfied, right? With the double bond. Okay, let's do formal charge consideration. Okay, let's do the octet again. You count everything individually. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight. Okay, so the octet rule is satisfied, so that's very valid. Okay, let's do formal charge here. Okay, formal charge. Count with me. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, what is oxygen happy at? Six. What's six minus six? Six minus six is zero. So the formal charge on this oxygen is going to be zero. Okay, here we have a formal charge of minus one on this oxygen. Here we have a formal charge of zero. Okay, so let's go back to our SO2 molecule. This part of our little toolkit. How do you think we will, uh, what should we do now? Uh, remember, there's no formal charge here. Okay, the SO2 is zero. So what do you think we should do with the um, S and the O and this and this S and that O? Yeah, we should put a double bond, right? Okay, so zero charge, zero formal charge, double bond. Okay, forgetting about the R. So perfect, right? A double bond and a double bond. Okay. <laughs> Our goal is to get 18 valence electrons. Eighteen, of va 18 valence electrons around SO2. So here we go. One, two, count with me. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Where do you think seventeen and eighteen should go? Where will it go? On the sulfur. Very good. Seventeen and eighteen. So that would be the best Lewis structure of SO2. Okay, so let's do our formal charge and octet rule. Okay, well, I'll just do this again for this oxygen, realizing it's the same for the other oxygen. So octet, we did this already, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the octet is satisfied. <coughs> And let's do the formal charge of this oxygen. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, right? Six. What is oxygen happy at? Oxygen is happy at six. Six minus six is zero. Okay, so formal charge of that oxygen is zero. Formal charge of that one is going to be zero. Okay, let me focus your attention or our attention on the sulfur. So let's do the oct uh, let's do the octet rule on this sulfur. We we'll count everything individually for the sulfur. Count everything individually. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, that's okay. okay. That's okay. That's okay. We'll call that an expanded octet. Uh, let's do the formal charge okay, for this sulfur. So count with me. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. What is sulfur happy at? What's sulfur happy at? Six. What's six minus six? Zero. Okay, so let's do this again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sulfur happy at six. Six minus six is zero. The formal charge on that sulfur is zero. Oh, the formal charge is zero everywhere. The problem has no charge. This is the best structure for SO2. <laughs> All right, a uh, couple of other things I want to tell you guys about. Okay, we're not done yet. Uh, let's look at the center atom of sulfur, the center sulfur. Um, the center sulfur has two bonds, okay, one double bond, our second double bond, okay, so it has two bonds and how many lone pairs? It has two bonds and one lone pair, okay, two bonds and one lone pair. So for two bonds and one lone pair, Okay, we're going to use um, either table 10-1 or 10-2. 
So make sure you bring those to the exam or have a copy handy with you or whatever internet thing you have. A table 10-1 and table 10-2. Okay, so bring to exam. So I'm going to use table 10-2 here. Uh, maybe not. I'm going to use table 10-2 here uh, because table 10-2 has lone pairs, right? Okay, so we got two bonds, one lone pair. Okay, if you have zero lone pairs, use 10-1. So two bonds, one lone pair, the geometry, this is what you want to look at. Okay, the geometry here is bent. So the molecular geometry of this compound is bent. Okay, this is what it will look like in three-dimensional space. And bent basically, it isn't like water. In fact, water is also your classic bent. To say SO2 is linear would be wrong. To say water is linear would be wrong. It's bent. Somehow that, I don't, somehow that electron <laughs> bends the molecule. So kind of draw it like this. So geometry is bent. All right. Uh, the next thing here is hybridization, the mixing of orbitals. So we need to get three, okay? Where is that three coming from? Two plus one is three. So hybridiz hybridization. All right, two plus one is three. How will I get to three? Okay, I'm gonna take one from S. And then how many from P? Two. Okay, so one from S and then two from P. This is an SP2 hybridized sulfur. SP2 hybridized sulfur. SP2 hybridized sulfur. All right, hybridization, sp2, the shape of this molecule is bent. Uh, the next thing uh, that we need to ask ourselves is whether this molecule is polar or nonpolar. All right, so if you, uh, this polarity stuff is important for chem 2. If you take chem 2, we start off talking about polarity. So um, is this polar or nonpolar? Well, this oxygen here is pulling this way. Oxygen is an electronegative element. So this is not a fair bond. It's not a 50-50 bond. Same thing with this oxygen. Okay, so this oxygen is pulling that way, giving it partial negative. Same, same thing with this oxygen. Okay, so the pull and then the pull. Okay, but look what this lone pair of electrons are doing. Okay, this lone pair of electrons are also pulling. Okay, so they're also pulling up. So they're not canceling one another. So this is going this way, that's going that way. They may cancel, these two may cancel, but this lone pair of electron, there's nothing canceling it. There's nothing canceling it. So this makes it a polar molecule, polar, okay? Nothing canceling it. If there was cancellation of the arrows, then yes, it's a nonpolar molecule, but this is a polar molecule. <laughs> All right, SO2, sulfur dioxide, two bonds, one lone pair, and SP2 hybridized sulfur. Molecular geometry, the shape of this molecule is bent. 
and it's a polar molecule, okay? Polar. Polar molecules have what's called a net dipole moment, okay? Something for um, next semester. Okay, the dipole, the negative is pulling, um, and then the center of the molecule is a negative end. And uh, we have also a partial negative at the ends. Okay, so the molecule is not really neutral. Partial negative here, partial negative at the ends. Polar molecule. All right, let's go over a couple of more things here. about this molecule. C2H2Cl2. C2H2Cl2. So let me tell you another kit from our toolkit here. Okay. Uh, one of them is carbon. Carbon loves to form bonds with other carbons. So toolkit two, just remember this in the back of your head. Carbon loves to form bonds with other carbons. Okay, in fact, this is the basis for organic chemistry. This is the basis for biochemistry. Carbon will like to form bonds with other carbons. So having said that, let's look at C2H2Cl2. All right. So carbon likes to form bonds with other carbons. So um, let's, let's just do that, right? Let's make a carbon bond with another carbon. So where would you want to put the H's? We've got two H's. Where would you want to put them? Uh, I'll pick on you, Elena. Okay, where, where would you want to put the H's? On the one C, okay. What about the second H? How about on this C? Okay, what about the CL? And then the CL there. Okay, so that's one construction. Okay, what else? What does carbon need? Carbon loves what number? Four. How will we get to four? We've got one, we've got two, we got three. How will we get to four? We will need a double bond between the C's, okay? Right, everyone see that? Okay, so that's one way to construct C2H2Cl2. Okay, so carbon must have four, right? One, two, three, four. By the way, um, just realize. Um, if you get to higher and higher chemistry textbooks, they don't put that lone pair, but um, usually halogens will have a lone pair. Okay. Uh, three lone pairs, I'm sorry. All right, so that's one. I mean, she's right. Elena's right. That's one way to make this molecule. But let me tell you something else. I could just as well. Okay, it's perfectly legal if I do this. You see, I'm going to have my CC double bond. Okay, but look what I'm going to do, Elena. Okay, I'm going to have this CL. Okay, why can't I put it there? Okay, it's perfectly legal. I can put the CL there. I'll leave this CL here. And I kind of am switching places. Okay, so I'll put the H here. I'll put the H there. Okay. Is that also a correct answer? Okay, the answer is yes. That is also just as valid. That's just as valid. All right, let me give you one more. <laughs> okay, you see the CLs here? Okay, they are on opposite side of the double bond. Opposite, okay. Uh, what's, the, what's the opposite of opposite? <laughs> what's the opposite of the opposite? Okay. The same. 
the same side. So here I have it on opposite sides of the double bond. What else can I have it as? The same side as the double bond, right? This is also just as valid. Okay. So this is something you constructed just as good. This is something that I constructed, which is just as fine. And then I can construct it like this. All right. So if you're given this on the exam, like which one is right? All right. Well, all three are right. All right. So that's called isomers. All right. So there's three different isomers of this molecule. Isomers, um, how I will dis define isomers as um, same molecule but different arrangement of atoms. Same molecule, but you see how Elena constructed this. Here's how I constructed it. Here's how I, here's another way you can construct it. They're both C2H2Cl2. See, this is C2H2Cl2. This is C2H2Cl2. And this one here is also C2H2Cl2. So it's the same molecule, C2H2Cl2, just different arrangements of the atoms. So it's the same molecule, but different arrangements of the atom. Same molecule, different arrangements of atoms. Okay, this isomer is a huge, big, big term. Okay, so let's get to, I don't want to get too complicated because you can go down a road of isomers that gets very complicated very fast. I just want to tell you about one type of isomer. Okay, you see this Cl here and this Cl here. Okay, so remember about these electronegative atoms. Okay, this Cl is pulling this way. Okay, that CL is pulling that way, right? Okay, so they are on opposite sides of the double bond. Opposite sides of the double bond. If it's on opposite sides of the double bond, it's called trans, okay? Trans means opposite in one of the ancient, uh, one of the ancient languages. I think it's Greek, okay? Or maybe Latin. But this is called the trans isomer. And you notice that this partial negative cancels out with that partial negative. So diagonally, they cancel out. So they cancel out diagonally. This is nonpolar. Nonpolar molecule. Quite the opposite with this CL here. Okay, so this CL is going to pull this way. The CL is going to pull that way. Okay, so they actually build on each other. And the um, net is going to be somewhere like this down. So this molecule is actually polar, this bottom portion, polar. So isomers are very, very different. Isomers are very different. This CL here that's on the same side of the double bond just talked about what's opposite. Okay, now I'm talking about the same side of the double bond. The same side of the double bond is called cis. Cis is, one, again, one of the ancient languages, Greek or Latin. It means same side. Cis isomer. Okay, so one isomer is trans, which just ha so happens to be nonpolar. The other isomer is cis which happens to be polar. Again, cis means the same side, if you want to. Uh, somehow you need to try to memorize that. Cis is same side of the double bond. Trans, 
opposite side of the double bond. Those are the only two types of isomers I'd like to teach you because you can get down this rabbit hole <laughs> and go very deep. Right? But we'll be very simple here in Chem 1. Right? Cis isomer, trans isomer. By the way, I um, want to tell you guys to focus on this carbon here. Let's focus on this carbon. Okay, how many bonds and how many lone pairs? Okay, we got one bond, it's single. Two bonds, single. What about this one? Double, so three. Right, three. So this carbon is three bonds, zero lone pairs. Same thing with this carbon, right? Is it not so? Three bonds and zero lone pairs. All right, three bonds, zero lone pairs. So what's three bonds and zero lone pairs? Okay. Uh, it's trigonal planar. Okay, table ten one. So this and this, both carbons, both carbons are trigonal planar. Okay, so trigonal planar. Three bonds, zero lone pairs. Okay, what hybridization is that? How will we get to three? Okay, we'll take one from S, and then how many from P? Two. Okay, two P plus one S is three. Three bonds, zero lone pairs, trigonal planar. We look that up in our table. And this carbon, as well as that carbon, is an sp2 hybridized carbon. Okay, sp2 hybridized carbon. <laughs> All these carbons are sp2 hybridized. Okay, it has two carbons, two central atoms. Okay, sp2 hybridized carbon here, and the double bond attached to it there. Two hybridized. I'm sorry, two sp2 carbons. Sp2 carbon, sp2 carbon, trigonal planar carbon, trigonal planar carbon. Okay, how do I know it's trigonal planar? Okay, you just look that up in table table 10.1. All right, let me tell you a story and relax just for a couple of minutes about isomers. Um, probably all of you are too young, but um, in the 1970s, they would give pregnant women a drug, and this drug was called thalidomide. This is not something you need to know. But. So it was a drug to treat nausea because pregnant women had you know, some pregnant women had very extreme, you know, terrible nausea. I know my wife had terrible nausea. They had to admit her and all sorts of stuff. So in the 70s, uh, they would give this drug, the lidomide, to sort of, I guess, combat or slow down the nausea symptoms. And what happened was, well, it was good. I mean, the nausea definitely went down. The problem was uh, the babies born to these pregnant women were, had defects. Okay, they had substantial birth defects. Uh, missing limbs, extra ears, um, um, you know, arm was deformed. They suffered from deformities, birth defects. Okay, it's called teratogens, teratogens, teratogenic babies okay, with birth defects. Um, so what they found out later on was uh, this thalidomide that was given during uh, the early stages of pregnancy. Yes, it helped cure the nausea, but it was also responsible for the birth defects of these children. So what was causing these birth defects? What was causing these missing limbs and deformed arms and feet? Okay, what was causing this was one of the isomers of the drug. So one isomer of the drug, one form of the drug cured the nausea, okay, but the other isomer was causing the birth defects. Okay. Nobody had any idea, had any clue 
in the 1970s, 50 years ago. No one had any idea, any clue that it was one other form because this is exactly the same molecule. It's just the atoms are arranged differently. Nobody knew <laughs> until much, much later. So eventually they banned thalidomide and no longer it's given for people who are pregnant women. Okay, so such is the big deal with isomers. If you do a drug, the problem is when you administer or give a drug or medicine, you always got to worry about if the isomer is causing harm. You always got to worry about that. Okay, for whatever drug they give. Okay. So that's an interesting story behind isomers. This is a rabbit hole because there's obviously not just cis trans isomers. It's a whole different way, a uh, whole different category of other types of isomers. Okay, but for all for all intents and purposes, we'll just uh, I just want you to know the cis isomer, double bond on the same side trans isomer, double bond opposite side. Very different properties, right? This one is nonpolar, that one is polar. Uh, this one is not cis or trans. It's, it's just, um, it's nothing. It's just an isomer. Okay. So plain old isomer, trans isomer, cis isomer. A <clears throat> right, um, couple of things here. Just want to remind you, hopefully this will come as a review. Okay, when you have a double bond, okay, a double bond is um, one sigma, okay, but it's also one pi. Okay, one sigma and one pi. Okay. So a pi is an overlap of a p orbital. Pi bond is an overlap of a p orbital. And a sigma bond is an overlap of, remember this, s orbitals. Remember? S orbitals. And an s orbital is j just a simple sphere. The approximation of electron density represents a sphere. So I'll draw an s orbital overlap between this carbon and this hydrogen. Okay, so the s orbital overlap is a sigma bond. The pi orbital overlap is um, the overlap of a p orbital that's shown in dark green here. So that's p, one p lobe of the carbon interacting very nicely with another p lobe of this second carbon. All right, any questions? Let me just give you one more thing, and then um, you know I think I'll just end the class in terms of the material. Okay, everything from here on out will just be review. All right, so isomers, and then don't forget your o uh, overlaps of the orbitals. All right, let's uh, go back to our toolkit here just for one moment here. Carbon loves to form bonds with other carbons. Just want to tell you another thing, halogens, okay? And generally, they would like to be single bonds, okay? This was something that I got a lot of emails on in the lab, on the, something about AX3 or something. So halogens, we're gonna call X a halogen. Okay, they tend to be like this. Okay, so X, what is X? It's your halogens. Okay, C, L, F, B, R, okay, iodine, okay. So that's one thing in our toolkit, so halogens. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, what is halogens happy at? Seven, so seven minus seven is a zero. 
So generally, we have halogens with a single bond, generally speaking. So that's uh, a tool that you can put on your toolkit. Okay, sometimes we do have exceptions, okay. Okay, as examples, um, ClO2, uh, Cl uh, minus, ClO3 minus, uh, ClO4 minus. These are kind of exceptions. They are usually resonance stabilized, but for the most part, this is what you want to do with halogens. Single bond. All right, let me tell you uh, one last kit uh, tool in our kit. Uh, carbon can also, remember, carbon loves to form bonds with other carbons. Uh, this is the basis for a lot of your organic and biochemistry. The fourth little tool in our toolkit is that carbon likes to form rings. Okay? Carbon. likes to form rings. Okay. Rings, that means the molecule closes in on itself. Okay, the example of this is benzene. So let's draw the Lewis structure of benzene now. So benzene is where we are at. C6H6 is benzene. Okay. <coughs> All right, so if this forms a ring, okay, what do you think the shape of this molecule will be? What has six sides? Hexagon, okay? C6H6 is benzene, so these carbons will form a ring, sort of a ring structure. Uh, they'll close in on itself, and it will be a hexagon. So let's draw that here. So carbon, 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 and a carbon. Let's put our six H's here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So again, Elena, this comes back to a question from um, our previous problem. How will we get to four for this carbon? can put a double bond, yeah. So let's put a double bond here. Let's not put a double bond there. That's going to mess it up. But we can put a double bond on the alternative. And then what's next? Can't put a double bond here. But we can put a double bond on the alternative. Everyone see that? That's not the only structure for benzene. Okay. What else is there? You see, I just kind of put my double bonds here, here, and here. But I could also, I could also put my double bonds there, there, and there. Okay. So benzene has what's called a resonance. Okay. So those double bonds are literally delocalized across all six carbon atoms. Carbon one carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6, right? The double bonds can move around. So let me draw this uh, form of benzene. Okay. So back and forth, back and forth, they can go. Okay. 
Okay, don't forget your back and forth arrows. Don't forget these two arrows. <laughs> it's going back and forth. So what we have here is the resonance structure of benzene. A beautiful resonance structure. And um, you don't see benzene written like this in more higher level chemistry books. Uh, what you see benzene as is written kind of like this. Okay, you see this carbon number one? Okay. I'm going to make that a dot. You see this carbon number two? I'm going to make that a dot. So I'm just going to make all the carbons a little dot. Okay, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so, or point, dot, whatever you want to call it. So we're going to call these the carbons. And uh, that's one way uh, benzene is depicted. Okay. okay, so a little point for the carbon, point for the carbon, point for each of the six carbons. Okay, so don't forget my carbon numbering here. Okay, one. Two, three, four, five, six. So instead of um, writing the C's, I'm just um, putting it as a point, and I'm also omitting the car hydrogens. I can omit the hydrogen. So that's one way to also depict this resonance. Okay, this and this are the same thing. But this is not how you'll see it drawn in other textbooks. Actually, because of the delocalization of the double bond, okay, so I'm going to write delocalization of double bonds across all six carbons because they are like buzzing around. across all of these carbons. Okay, so that double bond is like a bee buzzing. It's buzzing around. You don't even see this in textbooks drawn like this. You'll see it in textbooks drawn like this, a circle. Okay, I'm omitting the hydrogens, but this is how you will see benzene drawn. Yeah, this is a carbon. Okay. That's a carbon. 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 So instead of drawing out the letter C, we just put a little point. But if we saw that, would we know that that's benzene? Or is if that you see this or this, you'll know it's benzene. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is how, if you look at another textbook or even your textbook or on the internet, you'll see benzene like this. Why do they not put the hydrogen? Um, it's a, the hydrogens are there, but they're omitted. Um, it's just inferred. Gotcha. They just know it. Okay. okay. They just know it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a good question, but uh, those are called, um, uh, they just know the hydrogens are there. Okay. Now, Again, I don't want to go down a deep hole with you, Elizabeth, but if I do this, okay, a hydrogen is not there. A Cl is there. But a hydrogen is here, a hydrogen is here, a hydrogen is here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here. Hydrogen is not here. Why? Because I put a Cl. So it's a good question. All right, so um, yeah, so the circle around the benzene okay, represents two things. Um, it represents um, delocalization. Okay, the double bond is delocalized. Okay, this is also called an aromatic ring. Okay, so for all the people that are taking organic chemistry, okay, this whole Basically, you know, including biochemistry, this whole aromaticity is very essential. You'll see a lot of these in our bodies. Okay? This, again, is the essence of organic. Carbon loves to form bonds with carbon. 
carbon loves to form ring structures. All right? So it's a very interesting molecule, this benzene. All right, one, for, one final thing I want to show you I, about this benzene. Let me draw one of these again. Okay, I'll just draw this. I can just I can draw this, or I can draw that. It's the same thing because it's resonance. Okay, so let me draw one. Okay, so um, I'll draw this form. So here's one re representation of the benzene molecule. So let me jog up your memory here. Okay, remember what this double bond represents? Okay, the double bond is also called a pi bond. This double bond is also called a pi bond. So here's our carbons. One more time. One, two, three, four. Five, six. So this double bond represents a pi bond. So a pi bond is an overlap of a p orbital. So let me draw one p orbital of this carbon and one p orbital of this carbon. Okay. Here's a double bond. Okay. So let's do the overlap there. The double bond is also known as a pi bond. It's an overlap of p lobes. Okay, what about this double bond? It's the same thing. Okay. And um, I hope I can. Well, I'm not, as I said many times before, and I'll say it again, I'm definitely not a Picasso. But what you can see here with all these p orbitals is the overlap. Okay? So we have an overlap of p lobes above. the plane of the ring. Okay, an overlap above the plane of the ring. And also, we have overlap below the plane of the ring. People are just good at seeing things in three dimensions. Others, maybe not. You know, I'm probably not. But um, the the lower lobes of the peas are overlapping nicely with one another. That's um, trying to show that in purple. And then the upper lobes, the upper lobes of the pea are overlapping nicely with one another. Okay, so to form a bond, we need an overlap. And I'm trying to depict that as pink, OK? Uh, could be better. <laughs> but you have a uh, overlap above and an overlap below. That is the p, p lobes above the plane of the ring and 
and P overlap below the plane of the ring. So what this means is that you have a lot of stability. Okay, aromatic, aromaticity or aromatic compounds are very, very stable. They also happen to smell. That's, that's why they're called aromatic rings. And um, yeah, it's pretty neat. So much that can be de deciphered from this benzene molecule. Okay, pi overlap above, pi overlap below. Okay, this is also called pi stacking. Now, um, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, Alzheimer's, a neurodegenerative disease. So one, some people actually think it's this pi stacking. Uh, of uh, molecules that have benzene, that have this aromatic ring. A lot of people believe that, um, you see, this has um, overlap above, and it could pi overlap with something, another benzene above. This below can pi stack with another benzene below, which in turn can stack with another one below, which in turn can stack with another below, which in turn can stack with another below. So these pi stacking can occur above and below. And what happens is that um, if it's a protein um, with these um, pi stacking, they'll stack, 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 and eventually they'll precipitate out of the brain cell. And that's why people with Alzheimer's disease have these plaques, which you can only notice and see after, you know, after death, post-mortem. Post you look at these brain slices, and they have these amyloid plaques. They're called amyloid plaques. And these plaques, at least one hypothesis is, is that re uh, result, these plaques, one hypothesis is, are a result of pi stacking, okay, because uh, pi stacking of uh, molecules that have aromatic rings stacking above. You can imagine this benzene stacking with another benzene, stacking with another benzene, stacking with another benzene, stacking, stacking, stacking. You can imagine the stack, 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 stacking. They aggregate. Eventually they, eventually they precipitate out of the cell, okay, forming these plaques. Anyways, that's something that's uh, potentially interesting if you uh, like that sort of thing, okay, <laughs> what causes Alzheimer's disease. One interesting hypothesis is this idea of pi stacking. Okay, here we have pi overlaps above and below the plane of the ring of one benzene molecule. Okay. So um, it's 1.30 now. I think what I'll do is I'll end class and we'll have our review on Thursday. So make sure you come to class Thursday and uh, we'll go over the 25 multiple choice questions of the test. So um, come Thursday with any questions or doubts.